for me. Persistent depressive disorder is new to the DSM-5 and essentially combines major depressive disorder with a more persistent but milder DSM-4 diagnosis of dysthymic disorder. We don't have dysthymic disorder. And for, well, fortunately, I don't care. It doesn't really matter to me. Dysthymic disorder is kind of like the blues, if you get the blues. Uh, so uh, uh, persistent uh, depressive disorder, you, you, you're either deep in depression or you're, you're not feeling so hot. You know, you're just feeling kind of blue. You know, this is a bad day for me. So that's what persistent de depressive disorder. If you knew somebody like this, uh, they would never be happy. Uh, but sometimes they're less unhappy than they were yesterday. Okay. And that, that's, uh, that's what uh, a persistent depressive disorder looks like. It involves a nearly continuous state of depressive mood that has lasted for two years without much respite. In other words, nothing makes these, this person happy. Uh, you plan a vacation to Disneyland, you go to Disneyland and you hope that they're just going to be unhappy that day and not really unhappy that day. They're not so depressed they can't get out of, their, out of the uh, hotel room. You're just hoping that they're depressed. And of course, they're always the slowest one, the one that walks the slowest, no offense, knows. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, so you know, dad's got to stay back with mom because she's got this persistent depressive disorder thing going on. You know, and the kids are all running ahead. Uh, and half the time, they're trying to stay away from her. They're trying to stay away from her because they bring her down. Right? She brings them down. So a lot of times, these kids are not really trying to interact with their mother. Now, strangely enough, one of the things that the kids will do is that uh, at the dinner table, instead of sitting there and listening to mom whine all night, they will eat as fast as they possibly can and get away from the table. They'll use any excuse not to be there because mom is just a downer. Anyway, that's persistent uh, depressive disorders. Of course, it can happen to males just like it happens to females. I'm picking on moms for no reason whatsoever, just because I mean today, I guess. And I spent all weekend reading papers. Uh, also new to the DSM-5 is disruptive mood regulation disorder. It involves chronic, severe irritability it manifested by temper outbursts beginning before 10 years of age and extending to age 18. Uh, so these are kids that are constantly in trouble. They are disruptive. Uh, so in the old days, of course, we called them, uh, we said they had conduct disorder or oppositional defiant disorder or conduct disorder. Uh, now, of course, we call it uh, disruptive mood regulation disorder. We try not to diagnose anybody that's younger than the age of seven. Seven is second grade. And we very rarely actually see this in the first grade. If we do see it in the first grade, we probably will call it uh, something else. We'll call it, we won't call it a disruptive disorder. We'll probably assume that uh, the child is homesick and wants to go home to mommy. Outbursts must be persistent three times per week or more, and it has to be cross-situational. It can't just be in school. Um, it has to be in, in church. It has to be with at grandma's house. It has to be at home. It has to be in at least two different places. Uh, prevalence is estimated at 2 to 5%. That's an awful lot of really bad kids. My grandson is in the is in kindergarten right now. Cutest kid in the whole wide world. Wait a minute. I think I've got a picture of him. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to torture you guys with a picture of my grandson. They were supposed to have their first game this week, or uh, on Saturday, but I know, it'd be the cutest baby ever. Uh, these are, this is his uh, soccer, soccer stuff, stuff. Yeah. and there's his shoes. <laughs> He's got four, four shin guards, blue ones and, and black ones. He's got orange socks to go with his red <laughs> shirt. <laughs> He's got goalie gloves just in case he gets to play goalie. His mom's the coach, so I guess he can play goalie if he wants. Anyway. <laughs> Why was I talking about that? Oh, oh, oh. Um, he got in trouble the other day. Um, he got in trouble the other day for talking in class. And he says, Amaya. Amaya gets in trouble every day. And, and well, potentially Amaya has uh, disruptive mood 
regulation disorder. But uh, we sang him a little song and now he's fine. Children often show symptoms of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder as well and are at risk for depressive and anxiety disorders as adults. So these individuals are, in the old days of course, we diagnosed them with ADHD and conduct disorder or oppositional defiant disorder. But now of course we have, we have another disorder. We have disruptive mood regulation disorder, brand new one. Uh, another brand new thing for the, the, from the DSM-5 is premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Um, premenstrual dysphoric disorder concerns mood lability, uh, irritability, and depressive symptoms. And lability in this case means uh, heat. They're heat, they're labile, which means they're prone to overheat. Uh, symptoms must be present before menses, improve after menses onset, and become minimal by a week after menses. We used to call it premenstrual syndrome, but uh, this is, a, is more severe. Uh, it's really kind of interesting. Uh, because with the DSM-4, we had the premenstrual syndrome. Uh, there were female psychologists and psychiatrists uh, who petitioned the, the APA to uh, include premenstrual dysphoric disorder because they saw, of course, the men are, are probably not going to see as many cases as the women are. Uh, so they, they actually petitioned the uh, APA to, uh, to include this one, and they were successful. Actually, in the beginning, they weren't going to put it in, uh, but they wouldn't leave. So, because they couldn't get them out of their out of their building, they actually accepted this, uh, and probably the right uh, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Uh, symptoms must be present. Oh, I'm sorry, I've already read that. Premenstrual dysphoric disorder is not a culturally bound condition, although culture may influence the expression of symptoms. And of course, this is what they thought it was to begin with. There are select cultures that. Uh, uh, where you don't talk about menses, and so when the woman is, is suffering from menses, of course, there are, their reaction is a little bit more extreme. Uh, the incidence of premenstrual dysphoric disorder may be as high as 5.8% of menstruating women. 5.8%, and that's a lot if you think about it. Survey of 3,965 women in the United States indicated that women with premenstrual dysphoric disorder were more likely to experience suicidal ideation and more likely to make suicide attempts. And of course, this was what the, the huge fear was, uh, that if we ignore it and then, all, uh, then we have all of these suicides, uh, then we're going to have to admit that we were wrong. And of course, doctors never like to admit that they're wrong, ever. Uh, other uh, depressive disorders, substance medication induced mood disorder. Uh, it's because of the drugs you're taking or whatever the medication is that you're taking. Uh, depressive disorder due to a general medical condition such as uh, hypoglycemia will cause uh, depressive symptoms. Uh, what else causes depressive symptoms? Hypothyroidism uh, will cause uh, depressive symptoms as well. Um, causal factors of depressive disorders, biological factors, uh, maybe in your genes, your biochemical factors, uh, hormonal dysregulation, uh, sleep dysregulation, or neuro neuroanatomy. Maybe uh, we now at, at this point we think that uh, migraines are caused by uh, smaller than normal uh, blood vessels in your brain. That's what we think where migraines came from. Uh, or they come from. We're not exactly sure. Unfortunately, we can't really pin this down. Uh, it's very difficult to uh, to determine that. So potentially, the neuro your neuroanatomy may uh, cause uh, depressive disorders as well. Uh, psychosocial factors: anger turned inward, uh, infant mother attachment, uh, lack of reinforcement for non-depressed uh, behavior and potentially learned helplessness. These are the psychosocial factors. And we'll be going through these right now after I get a drink. Mood disorders occur more commonly within families and prevalence may be three times higher among first degree relatives. You may, you may know some houses around the reservation where everybody in the house is grouchy is depressed. I hope that's not your house. <laughs> it was my neighbor's house. Uh, we, it was a real downer to go and, and uh, uh, interact with a family. 
it wasn't just the mom, it wasn't just dad. Uh, it was both of them together. It was uh, the sisters in the, in the house. Uh, the only happy people were, were two of the boys. There were five kids in the family. And two of the boys were okay, but not when they were at home. When they were at home, they acted just like everybody else. You had to get them out of the house before, before they would uh, uh, do anything. Sometimes they'd just sit in front of the television and watch cartoons. Uh, but if you could get them out of the house and you could get them playing softball or baseball, you could them play softball. Uh, if you get them playing baseball, they were okay. If you take them down to the creek and start you know, throwing rocks at crawdads, they were okay. Uh, but you had to get them out of, the, out of the house. If they stay in the house, they acted just like everybody else. Um, five kids, let me think. The two boys were okay because they left home. Uh, they actually joined the Army uh, right after uh, they graduated from high school. So they were okay. Uh, the, there's three girls in the house. Uh, one of them is so, groto is so grotesquely overweight, she's got every medical problem you can possibly imagine. Uh, one of them uh, attempted suicide and got married. After she <laughs> attempted suicide, she got married. And now she's okay. Uh, and the other one had a baby uh, and because she was so overweight, uh, the child had uh, developmental problems. Uh, both of those two chubby ladies still live at home, unfortunately. But the one lady that left immediately lost weight, and the last I heard, she was okay. So the two kids, and I know, they needed to get out of the house. Anyway, so maybe there is a genetic uh, aspect to depression. Uh, twin and family studies show a moderate degree of genetic influence with heritability estimates of about 42% uh, for females and about 29% for males. Uh, the uh, 5 HTT serotonin uh, transporter gene on chromosome 17 has been associated in its short uh, homozygote, homo homozygote form with increased risk of depression. Uh, there is a, 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 a hypothesis out there called the monoamine hypothesis. Monoamine has to do with norepinephrine. It also has, uh, to some degree, it has to do with serotonin. Uh, but primarily, it, it deals with norepinephrine. Um, and of course, the monoamine hypothesis is that you, have, you don't have enough norepinephrine, you don't have enough uh, serotonin in your brain, and therefore you're, you are depressed. Drugs that inhibit monoamine oxidase, which breaks down uh, norepinephrine and, and serotonin, are useful in reducing depression in some patients. Uh, the tricyclics increase the available uh, amounts of norepinephrine. Uh, this, is, this has been cyclical. This is really kind of interesting. It's been cyclical. So initially, uh, we had the tricyclics. And the tricyclics uh, affected both the norepinephrine and the, uh, and the serotonin. Uh, the tricyclics were okay, they worked fine. Uh, the problem was they had too many side effects. Uh, so we tried not to use them. We were poisoning too many people, especially young kids, we were poisoning them. And of course, the side effects were not very pleasant. Uh, then we came up with this monoamine mono oxidase inhibitors. Uh, the monoamine oxidase inhibitors increased the norepinephrine level primarily, um, and it was okay. Uh, the problem was it had side effects. If you uh, took a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, you couldn't eat certain foods. If you ate certain foods, uh, your blood pressure would skyrocket and you would have uh, uh, your, your uh, temperature would go up and you had all kinds of interesting problems. So what are those foods that you couldn't eat? Well, you couldn't eat pickles and you couldn't eat olives. You couldn't eat anything for a minute, which means you couldn't have any beer. Uh, but nuts, you couldn't eat nuts. If you ate any of this stuff, uh, then you had a, a violent reaction to the point of dying. Uh, so that was really kind of a serious problem, as you can imagine. <laughs> anyway, so th then we came up with the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Uh, they don't really increase your norepinephrine level, but they really increase your serotonin level, and that seems to have worked, or has it? In the, in the beginning, we thought we were hitting about 90%. In other words, uh, we, were, we were handing these things out like uh, Tic Tacs, and uh, we were getting about 90% effect uh, from the, uh, uh, from the selective serotonin that we have taken However, we were wrong. 
thing. The reason we were wrong is because some of the pharmaceutical companies were doing their own research, and lo and behold, if they made a, a drug, it was a miracle drug, and it worked 90% of the time. So we had to throw all that stuff out, and we had to use independent researchers. And we're going to talk about some of those in just a second. Uh, there is inconsistent evidence to support the monoamine, uh, monoamine hypothesis. There is little indication that depression can be linked to levels of monoamines. Uh, studies often find normal levels of, of nor uh, norepinephrine and serotonin in depressed groups, and serotonin depletion manipulations do not reliably produce depression. In other words, we can reduce your level of serotonin or norepinephrine, and it, it may have no effect on you whatsoever. We could increase your serotonin level and increase your uh, norepinephrine level, and potentially you'll have no, uh, there, there will be no effect. Evidence is often directly contradictory to the hypothesis that depression is caused by a neurochemical imbalance. The relationship between depression and stressful events indicates that the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis plays a, uh, an important role in mood disorders. About half of those with major depressive disorders show abnormalities in the HPA system. Chronic stress can produce long-term HPA dysregulation in many people with major depressive disorder. What else? It is possible that hormonal uh, factors underlie the gender differences in the incidence of depressive mood disorders. Uh, we see a, uh, a, an increase of female depression, uh, two to three times that of the male depression. So why? Why, why, are, why are women more depressed? Than men. What's wrong with men? Or what's right with women? No, that's not right. Yeah, I got that. <laughs> <laughs> so what's going on here? And why in the world can women eat fats, cheese, ice cream, chocolate, and and, and their depression will go away? Why can't men do that? It doesn't work for men. And why can a guy go over to the gym and work out? and bust his tail and then come out of there with, and feel so much better than he did before. He's not depressed anymore. All he has to do is something physical. Now, why is that? Could it be hormones? <laughs> uh, women, I, 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 if this is a surprise to you guys, I, I apologize, but women have menstrual cycles. And when they have menstrual cycles, in order for them to be uh, fertile at select points during the month, uh, they have to have they, their estrogen level and their progesterone level have to fluctuate. And as long as it fluctuates, then they will have their menstrual period. And potentially they will be able to get pregnant. After they go through menopause, of course, they don't have these fluctuating estrogen and progesterone levels anymore. And they're less susceptible to depression. However, you are, they are more susceptible to heart attacks, to kidney stones, all kinds of different medical problems. So women have this cyclical uh, hormonal pattern that men don't have. And for that reason, they may be more, more susceptible to, uh, to depression. Mood disorders become more common in females after menarche and occur in the context of hormone-related changes that accompany premenstrual dysphoric disorder, postpartum onset depression, and menopause. As soon as they go through menopause, of course, they uh, all bets are off. Uh, their, their hormonal structure is, is more similar to the male hormonal structure. But that doesn't mean that you can punch the wall and be happy or go out because you don't have as much time. It's testosterone that makes men able to dissipate their depression through activity. Uh, and of course, uh, women need serotonin. Uh, so where do they get their serotonin from fat? Well, fat has what they call tryptophan. Tryptophan is a precursor for uh, serotonin, and therefore if they ingest more fats, they will feel better. Or more tryptophan. Uh, among depressed people, the latency of REM onset is shortened, and REM sleep periods tend to last longer. <clears throat> Uh, decreased time uh, to REM onset is one of the most reliable sleep disturbances associated with depression. 
And of course, this is one of the things that we were seeing with men suffering from P PTSD coming out of Vietnam. Uh, these individuals were were, try, were doing things so that they didn't go into Delta Wave sleep. And the reason is because the dreams that they were having while they were in Delta Wave sleep were uh, intrusive. They were dreaming about the war. They were dream, dreaming about the stuff that they had gone through. And for that reason, we started treating them with a with a uh, antidepressant called Desiree and Trazodone. And Trazodone made them skip over that Delta Wave sleep. Uh, but unfortunately, they were getting into REM sleep too fast. And if they were doing that, it was causing depression. So we were curing their PTSD by giving them, by, uh, by kicking them into depression. As sad as that may sound. Uh, sleep dysregulation does not appear to distinguish major depressive disorder from bipolar mood disorder. And of course, so we can't really use this REM sleep as a biomarker. Reduced activity of the prefrontal cortex and reduced volume of that area have been noted in people that were depressed. Uh, so what are they doing? Well, they're ruminating, but they're not thinking about things. They're ruminating about things. Uh, you can do that without using your prefrontal cortex. So what we need to do is get them to cure cancer. If we can get them to think about curing cancer, we can cure their depression. Because then they'd have to use their prefrontal cortex. Differences in activity in the hippocampus, the amygdala, and the anterior cingulate cortex indicate that the brain works differently in depressed persons than it does with people that aren't depressed. Some, but not all, studies indicate lower left <coughs> hemisphere activity with these select individuals. None of these differences appear to be necessary for the disorder. It is unclear whether these neuroanatomical uh, indicators precede depression onset co-occur with the disorder or result from expression of the disorder. So we have all of these things that take place, but we don't know if it's causing it or if it's just a cause of it. Intrapsychic processes uh, early in life interject the image of the bad mother, uh, the good bad mother into self-image. Uh, in, if an intensely ambivalent image of the good mother, bad, the good bad mother has been interjected, the experience of loss later in life reactivates the intense love-hate conflict. So what are we talking about with this good bad mother situation? What we're talking about is we have an individual and sometimes she's good and sometimes she's bad. Sometimes she acts like an angel and sometimes she's mean. And this, if you have this concept of your mother, this good and this bad, this, and, and there is no balance in that. She's either tipped one way or she's tipped the other. What are we talking about? Sounds like we're talking about somebody that's bipolar. Sometimes she's manic and sometimes she's depressed. If we have this situation, then we are more likely to see a situation where the child develops a love-hate relationship with their own mother. Anger and hatred uh, become directed inward uh, against the part of the individual that is the interjected bad mother. In other words, if your mother is being mean, uh, then you, uh, you can't hate your mother. Can you? Can you hate your mother? Is that possible? Do we allow, do I, do we allow ourselves to hate our mothers? Isn't that one of the, the uh, Ten Commandments? You have to, I have to respect your mother, your father. Don't you have to respect your parents? Is that one of the team in the okay. I was just wondering. I, sometimes I get confused. I get the ten commandments mixed up with other ten things or something. <laughs> <laughs> My ten favorite mental illnesses or something. Anyway, I get them all mixed up. So we're not really allowed to hate our mothers, are we? Uh, as a matter of fact, if we, go, if we are seven years old and we go to uh, talk to a, a counselor, what will that counselor tell us? Don't say anything bad about your mother. <clears throat> you need to, to be nice to your mother. Mothers are the ones that take care of you, uh, whether your mother's taking care of you, of you or not. So we're told we're, that we can't have bad thoughts about our mothers. So where does all that anger and that, all that hatred go? Yeah, we turn it in on ourselves, and that's, that's part of this good mother, bad mother situation. No empirical evidence of aggression turned inward is the source of de as the source of depression. Uh, we've got all of these hypotheses, and sometimes they fit, and sometimes they don't fit. So maybe we have lots of different causes for depression. 
Uh, maybe, and, and is it, is, are all mothers good? <laughs> Aren't they? No. Yeah. No? No? no. Are, they, are all mothers good? Some are good. Okay. But they're not all good. Are all mothers good? No. <laughs> <laughs> no? Are you sure? I thought they were sugar and spice and everything nice. Isn't that what women are? Well, that's little girls are sugar and spice. Are all mothers good? Salty. Bitter smooth. What do you think, Bruce? What do I think? My mother called me out of swear. I was like, <laughs> uh, my mother is pretty good, but she wasn't, I mean, she wasn't every mother, is she? No, yes. No. That's, My that's, mother used to go out and play baseball with it. That's kind of similar to when I was raised by the grandma. Okay. And the grandma was in that same boat as you were your mom. Okay. That's how uh, other animals are coming over to the rail, other dogs are coming over there. Okay. Mm -hmm. A couple more times, kick out of here. Throwing the door after you. Are all grandmothers good? Well, some of them are not. Oh, there you go. Yeah, some and not all. Mm -hmm. so, should we go around the room and find out if all your grandmothers are good? Do we need to do that? No, <laughs> no, no it doesn't always happen. Uh, we used to blame everything on the fathers, but now we know that if the mothers was not a good mother. <laughs> no, 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 no. Not Victorian fathers. Victorian fathers didn't even pay attention to the kids. That was, that was what was going on in the Western world. Okay? Fathers didn't pay any attention to their children. They weren't supposed to. Um, and if they did, then potentially they might mess up the, you know, mess up the child. That was the idea. So it was up to the mother to raise the child. Why the mother screwed up? I mean, some mothers are screwed up. Some mothers are really a mess. It's not my fault I didn't make it up. My own, my own wife. Why in the world would I ever marry somebody? My first <laughs> Why would I ever marry? Why did I marry this lady? Why did I impregnate her to begin with? Unfortunately. <laughs> Why would I do that? Why did I make this mistake? Because I, I had the idea that all women were good. And all mothers were... All, were women were natural mothers. I had this idea. Oh, I was in the What around what age was that? What age were you when you were in When I was knocking this lady up? Nineteen, I was nineteen. Yeah, nineteen. Nineteen. Wow, that's that was dirt. I was so stupid when I was nineteen. It's a child over there. I know. <laughs> My daughter was born when, uh, my daughter was born in September of uh, 1969 and I turned 20 in October of 1969. Oh my God. So I was 19 years and 11 months when my daughter was born. And if you can do the math, and she was born, uh, if you can do the math, I just turned 19. Just turned 19. <laughs> like two months before I turned 19. <laughs> not, not the smartest thing I ever did. I should have been more selective. I knew her mother was nutty as a fruit cake, so I should have taken that as a sign that possibly there was something wrong with her, or potentially would be something wrong with her. But I didn't. What if, what if she was right and you were wrong? What if she was right and I was wrong? And she left. She left when my son was nine months old. Her son too. Her son too. And then she didn't have anything to do with him for like the rest of her life. But she married a guy and raised his six children. I think you're right. I think there's something wrong with you. You wanted us to cure you. 
I was almost sure you wanted to graduate. <laughs> I was almost sure you wanted to pass this class. It was a real surprise to me. Hey, say what you said. <laughs> the quality of the maternal relationship may influence risk for depression. <sighs> so mothers have so much to do with their children, they can cause them to be depressed. Disruptions in attachment, emotional detachment, maternal abuse, or maternal depression all increase the risk for depression. Now the problem is that after a woman gives birth, uh, she has a drop in her progesterone level. Throughout her pregnancy, it's like skyrocketed. And all of a sudden, after she gives birth, it usually goes down. And sometimes it goes down slow, and sometimes it just plummets. And in those cases, sometimes we have uh, postpartum psychosis. Uh, but very frequently, frequently we get postpartum depression. Uh, I have read figures that postpartum depression may be as high as 80%. As 80%. Uh, you guys are really kind of lucky because you're, you live around your families. So you've got support. There's always support in the area. Uh, but if you look at Western man, uh, we not only moved away from our, our ancestors over to Europe, but we also moved, kept moving west. And as we moved west, we moved away from our families. We left them in Virginia. We left them in Massachusetts. We left them wherever the hell they were. New Jersey. Um, when I had... Uh, oh, well, okay. So, yeah. So here, here I am. Here I am in the military, but I, I, I uh, had... We had our children uh, right next to uh, her, her mother, mm -hmm. uh, which was okay, except her mother was not maternal. So her mother would come over and take care of the baby. Mm -hmm. uh, her sisters would come over and play with the baby, which means any, everything except change the diapers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, uh, and then, and of course I was in the military station in Florida, Texas, so eventually what happened was, uh, the baby was, uh, my son was born in January, and uh, they moved to Lubbock in, in February, February 22nd, I can remember the day. Uh, so the baby wasn't even uh, uh, two months old yet. It was barely a month old when they moved completely away from everybody. Now they're in Lubbock, Texas. If you've ever been in Lubbock, Texas, it's 200 miles from everything. Well, Amarillo's 200 miles north. Wichita Falls is 250 miles south, northeast. Uh, there's nothing in the area. You can't go anywhere. You can't even, if you leave Lubbock, then you drive out into the middle of the high desert, beyond West Chicago. Uh, it's really bad. The, the Comanches would, they owned it. I mean, they used to control it. Uh, and the Comanches we didn't even live up there. <laughs> They lived every. They lived around the Yamanosakado, but they would never go. Well, they they went up on the Yamanosakado to do horse racing, and that's about it. That's it. That's it. And they wouldn't even go up there. <clears throat> so here I was in Lubbock, Texas, uh, and she went. She didn't like it. She didn't like it at all. The isolation. She was away from her mother. Uh, was she depressed because of uh, of, of the baby that she had just given birth to? Possibly. It's possible, but nine months later, she was gone. Now, what's, what is the, uh, the, the oddity of this whole situation? Eventually, I left Lubbock, Texas, and, and I got married. I married a couple times, actually, and, and, I, and I went to Germany. Guess where she moved? Guess where she moved? Lubbock, well, Texas. Yeah, she lives in Texas. <laughs> She's lived in Lubbock, Texas ever since I was gone. So maybe, Sheldon, you are right. Maybe it had something to do with me. <laughs> <laughs> Lubbock was unattractive as long as I was there, but as soon as I left, it became the place to go. Behavioral. And like I said, she raised that guy's six kids. Uh, one armed mechanic, if you can imagine a one armed mechanic. Behavior, who looks just like my dad. <laughs> that was spooky. I saw a picture of her on Facebook. It's like the only picture I've seen of her on Facebook. She's sitting on this guy's lap. It's her husband, who looks just like my dad. <laughs> I know. Maybe she should have married my dad. 
Behavioral perspective assumes that depression is related to a relative loss of positive reinforcement and pleasure. Uh, this could happen in several ways. Fewer events may be reinforcing, of course. Fewer reinforcing events are available. Lack of social skills needed to obtain reinforcements. Response styles may have developed that are aversive to others. Uh, aversive control. One of the things that happened with my wife when she came down to Lubbock, uh, she grew her hair really, really long. But for some reason, the guys just would not leave her alone. And maybe that had something to do with it as well. Yeah. Yeah, I married her while I was 19. She was only 18. She had just turned 18 when I married her. And here she was in her early 20s. Uh, so, and there was a lot of stuff going on. She really missed her, her teenage years. Uh, so maybe that had something to do with it as well. Uh, and also there was, uh, there was not a whole hell of a lot to do in Lubbock, Texas, as you can imagine. So maybe that had something to do with it as well, except to, you know, mess with the guys. Mm -hmm. Flirt with the guys. Uh, it was a rich environment for a young lady with long hair. <laughs> People feel depressed because they engage in depressed ways of thinking. Uh, the depressed person selectively accepts the most negative in interpretation of events available and assumes that things will only get worse in the future. And this, of course, is, it all depends on what music you listen to. If you listen to depressed music about people breaking up all the time, guess what happens next? You get depressed and, well, you break up. I guess that's what happens next. A depressive cognitive triad characterizes depressive thinking, negative thoughts about the self, negative thoughts about the present, negative thoughts about the future. So you can't see, there is no light at the end of the tunnel. You don't like yourself, you don't like where you are, and you can't see anything positive in the future. So that is the, cog the, uh, cogn the depressive cognitive triad. I hate me, I hate now, and I hate the future. Siegel, Seligman in 1975 proposed the phrase learned helplessness to refer to learned uh, belief or ex expectation that is nothing uh, uh, one can do to improve a bad situation. Let me tell you what his experiment was. Uh, Seligman took a box and he put an electric grid on the bottom of it. Uh, he sectioned it off so that there were two sides. Uh, he would put a dog on one side and he would electrocute the dog. Well, sometimes uh, he wouldn't kill them. He would just made it, made it uncomfortable for them. Uh, so sometimes he gave them a way to escape into the other half of the box. And sometimes he didn't. If he put them in the half of the box and wouldn't allow them to escape when he was torturing them, uh, sometimes when he gave them a, the avenue of escape, they wouldn't escape. They, would, they had learned that they couldn't escape. And they would just stay on one side. And this ceiling been called learned helplessness. He had conditioned them to stay in a bad situation. Now, if we think of some of the uh, situations that women get in uh, with really abusive husbands, uh, potentially we see exactly the same thing. Uh, maybe if we think about uh, nursing homes, uh, where an individual has been placed there by their family, uh, it's not a very nice situation, it's not a very fun situation. Uh, if they give them the opportunity to leave, sometimes they won't. They'll just stay there. We see the same thing in prisons. Sometimes a guy has been in prison for uh, 10 years. He's been in the system. It's not fun. It's not a lot. It's not a very nice place to be. But when you let them out, they don't want to leave. They, they uh, have been conditioned to live in that type of, of an environment that they understand. And that's what learned uh, helplessness is. Depression is caused by learning that responses have no connection with outcomes. In other words, if you're in a, a uh, situation uh, where if you, uh, you, there's nothing you can do to change it. And so what, no matter what happens, even if the guy's nicer to you than he was before, and you see this on television all the time, you see it in movies all the time. The individual just doesn't want to leave, <clears throat> can't leave. Uh, my wife used to work at a uh, women's shelter uh, and uh, one of the first things she learned was that uh, it takes women six times coming into the shelter before they will actually get rid of the old man, that uh, they'll leave their husband, as odd as that may seem. And she didn't believe it. She didn't believe it until she saw it over and over and over again. Intelligent women. Uh, women with a, with a lot going for them. They still wouldn't leave their 
cousins. They would go back to them. Go back to the abuse, go back to whatever happened before. Uh, I think I told you the story of the uh, young lady that, uh, she was one of my students up at uh, Fort Nona. And she had a boyfriend. And uh, the first time she came in with a black eye, um, I asked her if everything was okay. And she said, oh, his friends took him out of me and pissed me. And every time he drinks whiskey, he gets aggressive and mean. And he punched me. It's never going to happen again. <laughs> About three weeks later, <laughs> guess who gave him the whiskey this time? She did. She gave him the whiskey. And he, bust, he busted her lip. Yeah. And he busted her lip. Don't worry, it's never going to happen again. He doesn't really like whiskey. Uh, I'm never going to give it to him again. And the next time, of course, it was uh, his friends who gave him the whiskey. Then, of course, he came up and, or he came home and he, he beat her pretty good. I mean, she had a black eye. Uh, he had loosened one of her teeth, but she didn't lose it. Luckily, she didn't lose it. Okay, this is the third time. Uh, so the fourth time it happened, she actually kicked him out. Uh, she actually kicked him out. And she was a really attractive. I think I told you this part of the story, too. <laughs> she was a really attractive lady. So as soon as this guy was gone, they were... There were guys, I mean, they were lined up outside. They wanted to hook up with it, I guess. I don't know. I don't understand these things. So the next day she came to, she came to school, she had hickeys all over her neck. And, uh, so evidently something happened. I don't understand. <laughs> I know, that doesn't really mean anything. She probably kept punching herself or something. Uh, anyway, but she went back with the guy. She went back with the guy, and this time, of course, he was, of course, he wasn't going to ever do it again. He was jealous of the guy. He wanted to fight him and all that other stuff. Eventually, she got out of that cycle by getting away from this guy. And she married a guy that didn't drink whiskey, I guess. Anyway, she's happy as a clam. Last time I saw her, she was happy as a clam. Okay. okay, so what's happening? Uh, uncontrollable and or unpredictable environmental stresses can cause a norepinephrine uh, uh, decrease or depletion in your system. Uh, attribution model of depression. Depression is caused by a, a pessimistic attribution uh, style across three dimensions, internal, external, stable, unstable, and global specific. Depression is caused by an attribution style that employs internal, stable, and global accounts of personal problems. So it's never going to get any better. Why? Because I think about everything internally. Uh, it's stable, so the bad, the bad thing is never going to get any better. Uh, my daughter was going through this. I was trying to get my daughter to leave Florida. Florida is a, can I say shoe hole? Yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> Florida is a pretty bad thing. They, they really don't pay their, their teachers very well. My daughter's down there. And of course, the, the, um, uh, the old farts uh, run the state just like they do here. Here, they don't want to pay any taxes for education, so the education in the state is crap because they don't pay the teachers very well. Uh, you've got the same situation here. They got the same situation in New Mexico. It's the same thing in Florida. They don't. They. She was making like forty-four thousand dollars a year, and she'd been doing. She'd been teaching in Florida for seventeen years. And she's making $44,000 a year. She's really good at her job. She was a Golden Apple uh, recipient. I know, Golden Apple. She was the best teacher in the county. You know what she got for that? No. No. However, my son was also a Golden Apple. He was uh, up for the Golden Apple. He got the scholarship for $7,500. So he actually got more for the scholarship that she got for actually go to the not a I know. So she's making forty-four thousand dollars a year. She's you know scraping by. She has to work two or three jobs, uh, and just in order to stay to survive in that really expensive environment. It's very expensive down there. Uh, so I was trying to get her to leave, and what did she tell me? She told me that uh, every place is the same. Uh, kids are bad wherever you go. The kids are really bad in Florida. But she said they were bad wherever you go. So it really doesn't matter where you go. Uh, the pay is about the same. The kids are about the same. But, you know, you, you run into exactly the same thing. For years she said that. 
And of course, I'm trying to tell them, no, 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 look at the, look at the uh, wage scale in Michigan. Look at the wage scale in Indiana. Look at the wage scale in Illinois. No, don't look at the wage scale in Illinois. Uh, look at the wage scale in Iowa. Finally, she moved to Iowa. But it took years to convince her that every place wasn't exactly the same. So why did she, why did she want to stay in Florida? Well, her boyfriend was there, and her baby daddy was there, and so that her son could see his father. And that was really important to her. But is it worth, she makes $64,000 a year. She makes like $12,000 more than that. Not that money is important. I don't need money. <laughs> Got you guys, what, what do I need money for? <laughs> I get all the insults I want from the back room. <laughs> as entertaining as all that is. <laughs> Why do I need money for? You know how much I pay for rent? Here? Hold on housing? How much? Nothing? Oh, it cost me twenty dollars a month. <laughs> Two bills, yeah, not bad. So there you go. You pay more than I do. Two bedroom or one? One. Two. Two. No, it's got two. I, I don't have yeah, two beds. It took me a long time to believe this what? They take it right out of my paycheck, so I don't even feel it. Maybe I wasn't supposed to tell you that. Maybe you probably make trouble now. I'll, I'll get fired. <laughs> <laughs> Stressful life events cause depression, especially when they are experienced as uncontrollable or unpredictable um, events. Uh, the intensity of stressors required to trigger depression appears to be less for, for each successive recurrence of the depressive episode. So it takes less. Uh, the more this happens to you, the less it takes to get you depressed. So it, it creates a cycle. And you get conditioned to this. So this is normal behavior now all of a sudden, uh, bad things. And this is one of the reasons why uh, people put up with bullying in school. The first time it happened, it was very upsetting. The second time it happened, it wasn't nearly as upsetting. And now it's just normal behavior, which is what happens at school. And it doesn't bother you nearly, nearly as much. What they discovered is, uh, a Danish study uh, discovered that the uh, individual that is depressed the most is the person that's doing the bullying, not the person that's being bullied. Eventually, they get used to it, but the bully doesn't, of course. The reason they're striking out is because they are depressed, because something is going on, and that's why they are a bully. Uh, there, there's something going on in their life. And, of course, that doesn't go away. So the negative thing that happens to this child, they get used to it, yeah. So it's the depressed, it's the uh, bully that becomes the, uh, uh, that is more depressed. If you remember the movie, I Love You, Beth Cooper. I Love You, Beth Cooper. If anybody's seen that movie, I Love You, Beth Cooper. Uh, this one individual bullied uh, the star of the, of the movie uh, uncontrollably throughout his, his grade school and high school career. And so the last thing that happens is the bully comes up and cries on the guy's shoulder and says, uh, how did you know that there was something wrong? I was, I was the one bullying you. How did you know that something was going on? And of course, that's true. It's real. That's the way it actually works. There is a strong tendency towards spontaneous recovery and recurrence. Uh, remission rates are, are between 70% and 75% for both genders over a two-year period. In the context of such levels of spontaneous improvement, treatment effects could be overestimated. The placebo response is quite high in the outcome uh, studies of depression, making the identification of effective treatments more effective. And this is really kind of exciting. As counselors, guess what? Remember, the brain is trying to cure itself all the time. So all you have to do is be there and talk to the person, and the person is going, their own brain is going to fix themselves. You don't even have to give them medication. You can give them medication. Maybe it will accelerate it a little bit, but we're going to see it, it, exactly how much it actually does accelerate. The human brain wants to be fixed. It doesn't want to be depressed. Depression hurts. And so it doesn't want to be that way. So you'll get an upregulation of uh, serotonin re receptor sites. So it's looking for seeking serotonin. 
All you have to do is give them a little bit of extra serotonin. Well, how can you give somebody serotonin? What can I do besides throwing pills at this person to raise their serotonin level? Mm -hmm. we, can, we can feed them. We'll feed them ice Twizzlers. <laughs> Twizzlers. Twizzlers. What a great idea. We'll just feed them raw sugar. Exercise. Exercise works. What can I do? I'm a counselor, so what can I do? How can I fix this person? How can I fix this person? What? I had a friend back in uh, at Fort Belmont, and her husband wouldn't let her get a word in edgewise. I mean, it was that bad. When she talked to me, I never said anything. She thought I was brilliant. I didn't say anything. She talked the whole time. And because she had me to talk to, well, it, it made her feel, it gave her self-esteem. She had a really low self-esteem before. And all she had to do was talk to me. I didn't even say anything. And it raised her self-esteem. It cured her depression. She was living in a junkyard. As horrible as in, in a trailer that, uh, they, that uh, there was no insulation. This is in Montana. So she would uh, buy uh, uh, paperback books and stack them along the walls in order, that was the current solution, was these paperback books, I know. That, was, that wasn't so depressing, you know, living in a trailer that has no insulation in Montana, where the wind whips underneath the trailer and blows up through, you can't go to the bathroom in the wintertime when it's, <laughs> it's minus anything because you've got minus degrees uh, <laughs> cold air blowing up on your bum. So she couldn't go to the bathroom. She'd have to go out and uh, yeah. We would talk about going outside <laughs> to, to pee. <laughs> anyway, okay, so uh, the, the human brain wants to be fixed. So we've got this placebo effect taking place. So we don't know if any medication is working or not. Antidepressant medications are demonstrably effective in randomized placebo controlled studies, uh, although no particular antidepressant has been consistently shown to be more effective than others. Medication is effective for 50 to 70 percent of outpatients in alleviating depression. Primary differences between classes of antidepressants concern side effects and safety, and as I told you before, the monoamine oxidase inhibitors have horrible side effects, as do the tricyclics. We were actually killing people with the tricyclics. Then we start giving the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, telling them don't drink any wine, don't eat any nuts, don't eat any olives. And guess what happened next? They drank their martinis with olives, of course they did. <laughs> and now they're dead. Okay, so we had lots of problems. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, of course, are killing them. Relapse is a significant problem when medication is discontinued. The risk can't be reduced, but not eliminated uh, by continuation of pharmacotherapy. Uh, and that's one of the, the things that we need to do is we need to keep these people on their medication. Remember when we were talking about schizophrenia, how often do they take their medication? Well, six months out of a year they'll take their medication. So that is a real serious problem as far as schizophrenia is concerned. It's a real serious problem as far as bipolar disorder is concerned. Uh, and the reason is because people like to be manic. It feels like you're on speed. So they like to be manic, and if I give them a medication, they'll, they, they, it, will, it will neutralize that mania. They won't have that, uh, that feeling anymore. So they very frequently will go off their medication. And then they will commit suicide because they get depressed, because they're off their medication. And uh, they want to feel good, and they, they only feel good when they're in the manic phase. It's the same way with depression. We can't let these people go off their medication. Today they're okay, tomorrow they'll be okay. It's gonna stay in their system for what, six weeks? Uh, but after those, that six weeks, they may get depressed and something uh, negative may happen to them. Uh, there have been indications of troubling research on antidepressant medications. This is the, medic this is the uh, uh, research I was telling you about before. Uh, remember the pharmaceutical companies were doing the research, and they were saying 90%, 90%, 90%, 91%. 91 oh, that's Paxil, 95% for Prozac. Oh, yeah, this is what's wrong what's working. Uh, this was perfect. Uh, one review found 48 of 51 published uh, studies, 94 percent, 
uh, reported positive outcomes, while FDA uh, database registered only 38 of 74 studies, 51% as reporting positive results. In other words, uh, the independent uh, studies were not showing positive results. They were certainly not showing 90% effectively. And this is a problem, because the pharmaceuticals companies lie to us. What do we do when somebody lies to us? Ignore it? Okay, that always works. <laughs> we did this for years with the uh, tobacco industry. They were lying to us for years. We knew that it was causing cancer. We had a life expectancy rate in the, in the uh, 50s, uh, high 50s, low 60s. Uh, when I was born in 1949, my life expectancy was 56. I'm 68, so I've gone past that. But in 1949, uh, tobacco companies, everybody smoked. Everybody smoked. Not only that, but if you went to visit somebody, there were ashtrays all over the house. And every, there was smoke in the air. So I was getting secondhand smoke and thirdhand smoke. I didn't smoke, of course. But yeah, I should have because everybody else smoked. So I was supposed to smoke. And I should have died at 56. Or I could have died at 56. I didn't. <laughs> I thought you were, you look worried there for a second. Okay. <laughs> Kirsch et al. in 2002 reviewed data submitted to the FDA for the top six antidepressant medications between 1987 and 1999 and concluded that only 18% of the response to medication was a result of the pharmacological components. Really? 18%? So I'm going to give you a medication that is only 18% effective? No, it's more effective than that. Why is it more effective? Because of the placebo effect, of course. Uh, he assumed that it had to do with the placebo effect. And this was in 2002. Uh, SSRIs remain among the most widely prescribed of all medications and are re routinely given to depressed patients as the first and often the only treatment uh, that, that are, they are given. Uh, we, it used to be psychologists that were giving away, let's see, uh, that were giving away SSRIs. Now doctors are giving it away. Uh, social workers are giving it away. Everybody's giving it away. Here, take this Prozac. Prozac used to be the number one medication in the world. It's not anymore, but it used to be. Before that, it was Valium. Now, it's... What's the number one pharmaceutical in the world? Viagra, of course, because everybody has erectile dysfunction, as strange as that may seem. So even if there is no problem, we can create a problem, and now we can sell pharmaceuticals. And how much does uh, how much does it cost? Do you guys have any? No, you guys have any clue how much the drug costs. It's thirty percent a pill. Thirty thirty dollars a pill. Thirty dollars a pill. How can they possibly charge you $30 a pill? Because people are willing to pay for it. And it's still the number one drug in the world. $30 a pill. So if you want to have sex 12 times a year, it's going to cost you... <laughs> <I know. laughs> Sell your car. Why not? Electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT, uh, is the application of, of electrical current across the head. It produces a convulsive seizure. We were curing, for the longest time, we've been curing uh, depression with seizures. We can put you in a seizure and your depression goes away. We were doing it with, uh, with cold baths. We were putting you in a bath that was so cold, and we left you in there so long that you, you started having seizures. And if it didn't kill you, you weren't depressed anymore. Then we started giving people uh, insulin. And we put them in insulin shock. And they they would start having seizures. And if it didn't kill you, your depression went away. I mean, this is working so perfectly. So now let's let's uh, juice you up. We're gonna put we're gonna put uh, several volts of, of electricity through your brain. And it'll put you into seizures, and if it doesn't kill you, your depression goes away. It works perfectly. This is great. ECT works more quickly uh, with a high, higher percentage of patients than the antidepressant drugs. 
If we give you a drug, it's probably the placebo effect that actually works. If we electrocute you, it works right away. <laughs> and it works for more people. I mean, this is perfect. So let's just juice people up. If we don't kill them, we'll make them less depressed. Its effective, uh, effectiveness is limited to severe depressive and obsessive compulsive symptoms, as odd as that seems. Uh, some individuals are so obsessive compulsive that they can't get anything done. And these are the individuals that we will, will juice up. We'll shoot them with uh, electric shock through the brain. And that, they'll go into seizures, and then their uh, OCD will go away. Well, let's not just use electric, electricity, let's use magnetism. Why not? I mean, it works on uh, muscles, doesn't it? If you put uh, a magnet on, if you've got a pulled muscle, it will heal faster if you put a magnet on it. Did you know that? It works sometimes. <laughs> it's better than nothing. Sure, magnets. Copper works. Magnet. Copper, yeah. Yeah, copper works for... Uh, Isn't that I'm sorry? <laughs> what, magnets? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah, it works. Yeah. Or at least they think it works. And if they think it works, then the placebo effect kicks in and it, and it works anyway, right? So all I have to do is tell you that it works. So let's use magnets and see if that works. Trans, transcranial magnetic stimulation are short, short pulses of magnetic stimulation at sub-seizure thresholds to stimulate areas of the cortex in the same manner as ECT, but without the first the seizures. In recent randomized controlled trials, uh, RTMS uh, was much less effective in producing short-term relief than ECT was. Recent data indicate that daily TMS for four to six weeks was effective in treatment-resistant patients with unipolar non-psychotic depression and improvements were maintained in a one-year follow-up. So maybe this stuff really works. But why not use it anyway? I mean, if, it's, if, if we can't cure you with the, the, the uh, drugs we have, then why not use uh, anything that comes along? I mean, what's the other possibility? We've got somebody, and we've hit him with Prozac, and we've hit him with uh, antipsychotic, we always do that. <clears throat> if we can't get the uh, SSRIs to work, we'll always hit up with the antipsychotics. Uh, clomiphene, uh, the anti-anxiety drugs. Uh, if none of these things work, then why not try magnets? Why not try ECT? Sometimes we have to try ECT because there's no other way to treat the person. We just have to do it. We don't want to. We have to send them to a psychiatrist first. Psychologists can't do that. Uh, interpersonal therapy, uh, behavior therapy, and cognitive therapy are included among the well-established psychological interventions for depression. Brief dynamic therapy, self-control therapy, and social problem-solving therapy are pro probably efficacious treatments. In other words, they, do, they work as well. Uh, certain psychotherapies are equally as effective as medication and have lower risk of relapse in the treatment of major depressive disorder. So if it's a minor depression, if somebody's just the stymic like my friend was, all, all you need to do is talk to the individual. Was I using anything on her? I didn't even get to talk, okay? All she needed to do was talk, and that actually fixed her. <clears throat> so I was able to fix her just by keeping my mouth shut. <laughs> you guys are suffering because I'm not keeping my mouth shut, obviously. Beck's cognitive behavior therapy is at least as effective as standard antidepressant medications. So something, something works. CBT typically involves identifying and challenging dysfunctional belief uh, patterns about the self and the world. Usually these individuals, the reason they're depressed is because they've got these really skewed ideas about what's going on in the world. And, how, and, and what they need uh, from their parents. Uh, their mother tells them what they need. Their mother tells them that they need to be loved all the time. Uh, their mother threatens to take away their love, the, her love if they don't do what she tells them to do. These kinds of things happen in, in uh, dysfunctional families. Yeah, of course they're brainwashed. But who's going to brainwash you the best? 
mom is. Nobody cares about dad. Dad was from out there somewhere. But uh, mom is there all the time. She's the one that feeds you. She's the one that either makes your favorite food or makes the stuff that you hate for supper tonight. So she has all that control over what's going to happen next. And if she tells you, you have to, that you have to love her uh, in order, or you have to get good grades, or you have to be an athlete in order to, uh, uh, to get her love, then by golly, you'll do it. Dad, dad, nobody gives a shit about Dad. Dad didn't come home until 7 o'clock anyway. Uh, he was so tired that all he did was eat dinner and go to bed or watch television. Uh, nobody cares about that. That's, that's kind of out there somewhere. The only time you ever get to talk to him is on the weekends anyway. And usually he's gone. So because he's got something to do. He's got to fix the car, so he has to go get a part. <laughs> CBT typically involves identifying and challenging dysfunctional belief patterns. Uh, CBT often combines with behavioral homework to increase activity levels, practice newly acquired personal skills, and counteract the prevailing perspective of self-failure. One of the interesting things about CBT is they'll give you homework. And the homework usually has to do with uh, uh, you doing something that you don't want to do. Uh, you need to go to the mall and be nice to five people or something. Or you need to go to, the, uh, to, to Walmart and stand out in the middle of the uh, parking lot and sing. They'll, they'll do this stuff to you. Really? Yeah, oh yeah, they'll do this kind of stuff to you. It's really kind of funny. And then you'll go back. And you'll say, uh, he'll say, well, how did it go? Oh, really well, really well. He said, you didn't do it, did you? He can read me so well. So you'll have to go back and do it. Until, until you do it. You know, and then he can tell when you actually did it because you'll, your face will look good. You'll look happy because you did something that you, you didn't want to do. That's what the way CBT works. It's a lot of fun, actually, CBT. Its effectiveness uh, makes it the gold standard against which other psychotherapies have been compared. And actually, your textbook talks about CBT almost exclusively and tries to pretend that the others don't exist. Uh, behavior therapy is effective for depression. A variety of techniques are used with behavior therapy approaches for depression, including self-reinforcement and social skills training. Uh, behavioral activation seeks the institute to institute behavior change by increasing activity levels and encouraging an approach rather than avoidance of difficult situations. This is how bad I am. This, today, this lady called me on the telephone. She's trying to sell me something. <laughs> She's trying to sell me a new textbook. A new textbook <laughs> She's trying to sell me a new textbook for this class. You guys will want a new textbook for this class. Montana textbook. So I'm talking to this lady, and, and so we're talking for like five minutes, and I'm not really saying anything. And then all of a sudden, I, I said something controversial. And, uh, and then she just took off. And for the next 30 minutes, I was on the phone for 30 minutes. I didn't really prepare for this class very well because I was talking to her for like 45 minutes. Oh my God, you said five minutes. I talked to her for five minutes, <laughs> then she went off for 30 minutes, and then it took me that long to get off the damn telephone. To, to hang on the telephone. I know. I don't know if usually have not. Sure. <laughs> this lady makes her money. Talk, uh, calling people on the telephone. She, she, she sells textbooks. So she makes money by making lots of calls. So if she spends 45 minutes on the telephone with me, that means there's she probably missed five or six different calls that she didn't make this afternoon. This afternoon. But she spent that much time with me on the telephone. I don't know. Maybe I listened to really well. I don't know, but I should have patience. And of course, the lady in, in Montana, I liked her. I really liked her, so <laughs> well, I could see her. For one thing, I could see her. And this lady I've never met her before. But we spent 45 minutes on the damn telephone. 
because I couldn't get her to shut up. Is that Lucy? I thought she's so cool. She's probably like, yeah, I need to. Do you identify with Lucy? Yeah. I hope not. Yeah, I'm listening up for Lucy. <laughs> Anyway, that's that's my problem. That's my own problem. Sorry. But I can't get my wife to talk to me on the phone. This this drives me nuts. So I get on the phone with a perfect stranger, and she's on the phone for 45 minutes. I call my wife on the phone, and you know it's like monosyllabic words. And, Hi, how are you? And, you know, it's, that's that's about it. But I can't I can't get my wife to say anything. Oh, it's a jumper. That's so cool. I know, I can't get my wife to talk to me. Interpersonal psychotherapy focuses on identification and improvement of a person's difficulties in interpersonal functioning. Acceptance and commitment therapy, ACT, positive psychotherapy, seeks to increase engagement in positive emotions through practice. Uh, I am a positive psychologist. That's what I try to use. Is it working? Is it working? <laughs> Evidently, it works on some people, it doesn't work on others. It won't work on my wife, but it works on perfect strangers on the telephone. <laughs> Sleep deprivation is one of the most rapid but least commonly used interventions to treat depression. Uh, prevention, uh, preventing REM sleep can produce a 50% decrease in symptom severity within a few hours for between 30% and 60% of patients, although the impro improvement is short-lived Relapse occurs after even a brief nap. Okay, so we can actually cure your depression. All you need to do is stay up one night. Yeah, yeah skip, skip one night's sleep, and that will work. That does not make sense to me. Well, you skip the REM sleep. What you're doing is ruminating while you're sleeping. You're, you're dreaming about things that are making you depressed. So if we can make you skip the REM sleep, and you don't ruminate it about it tonight, now you're okay. The problem is, if we let you go to sleep again, you <laughs> relapse. <laughs> but we can do this. We, if we can keep you from going, getting into REM sleep, we can actually cure you. For the moment, your depression will de decrease. Okay. <clears throat> so, potentially what we can do if we've got somebody with severe depression, Potentially, we could keep them up some night, maybe force them to watch zombie movies on television, whatever. Uh, if we can make them watch something that isn't what is bothering them, then potentially them skip, skipping sleep will actually cure them to some extent, will actually bring them out of their depression. And that way, we don't have to shock them like we did all those other people or give them a shot of insulin or something horrible. Why don't we stop right here, we'll pick this up next time, we'll start talking about bipolar disorder, as much fun as bipolar disorder is. I know I'm a little bit behind and I apologize for that, but I had to give you guys that.